to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Good to be back in this pulpit. And uh, I've missed it, even though it was only a couple weeks. But uh, anyway, it's good to, good to be here. We'll see what the Lord has for us today. Uh, let's begin reading here in verse 20, Matthew chapter 20, and we will begin in verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshiping him, coming to Jesus, and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand, the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, uh, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. This was the cup of suffering. This is the sacrifice he was going to make. And he saith unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. And when the ten heard it, okay, there's twelve disciples, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But, when, but Jesus called uh, them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. They that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, not preacher, minister. We minister one to another. The Bible says Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for all. It says, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Father, we ask your blessing on your word today. And we pray, Father, for peace. We pray for strength. We pray for comfort. We pray for your will to be done. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for the leaders of our country. We lift them up to you today. We pray for our homes. We pray for our churches. We pray for our relationships one to another, and we pray that you'd give us wisdom now. For your glory and honor, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not sure if you read the devotional that we, we put out a devotional every week. Um, and it's, it's on there that you can read it before coming to church. And I, I did one on politics. And uh, there's a definition, there's a good definition for politics. I know my definition that we laugh at is poly, which is many-sided figure, or polygon, and the tick is a blood-sucking insect. So politics are many blood-sucking insects. But, but there is a good definition to it also. Remember, there's a principle. What God creates the devil corrupts. And so it is a good thing uh, gone bad in many instances. But it's a science of government. It's governing. It's, it's a ruler, ruling over. And there is a good point to that. Um, and the reason for the government is for the preser preservation of its safety, peace, and prosperity. In the devotional, I brought out some truths about 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel was a judge in Israel. And the way that Israel lived is the prophet would hear from God and he would share that message with the people and they would follow God. So God was their king. And, but the people wanted a king like the land had kings, like, like the world had kings. And uh, they didn't like what Samuel's sons were, were doing and so they made up all these reasons and excuses and they demanded a king. And they got what they wanted, but they lost what they had. And uh, that's the way it works out sometime. But that was the government that was established after that. Um, I think it's an important thing to realize that as this election is coming, we pray for our leaders. We pray for the election. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I know how I'd like it to turn out. But our country is governed by our Constitution. 
And when I was thinking about this message, I was thinking, I've never read the entire Constitution. Anybody here ever read the entire Constitution? There's a Bill of Rights and all this Constitution. But it, our, our land was conceived in liberty and dedicated. Who is that? Uh, Abraham Lincoln? Dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. There's all these principles in God we trust. And so our land was founded under those principles. When you come into the Christian life, we have a Bible. Amen? There are people today that are not following the Constitution in the secular realm, and there are people today that don't follow the Bible. Both of those uh, writings were designed to give peace, to give security, to give prosperity. And I think if we follow those things, we'll be in the right direction. Um, in Matthew chapter 8, and, and kind of remember this, that everybody here has somebody over them. And everybody here has somebody under them. I've got two great-grandsons. One's three and one's two. Guess who wants to be the boss? The one that's three. He's a little bit older, right? But in Matthew chapter 8, there's a story about the centurion. He's a Roman soldier who is over other Roman soldiers. He's a leader. And his servant is very ill. And so he comes to the Lord and he says, my servant is sick. And the Lord says, well, I will come to your house and this centurion said no you don't have to come say the word only and my servant shall be healed and then he went on to say I am a man under authority and then I say to this man go and he goeth and this man come and he cometh he says I am under authority but in authority and the Lord said I have not found so great faith in all Israel you get it that's what he was saying Everybody is under an authority, and we are under God, one nation under God, amen? And yet we are in authority over other people. I have found in my life, you've probably seen this too, uh, one example, I worked at General Motors, and I worked in the materials department, but whenever the hierarchy or the, the people in charge would make one of the hourly employees a salaried employee, we called them white shirts, they were, they were leaders. You would be surprised how a person's attitude changed when they were under authority to now having authority. The Bible talks about that, uh, where not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Position can ruin some people, amen? And it is a temptation all the time to want to rule and have it our way where God puts us together so we have it his way and that is the purpose of our nation that is the purpose of our church amen that we might follow the Lord um, there's three things this morning I want to look at in the message and we'll see them pop up here and there and don't hold me to that because I don't know which road I'm going to go down today all I know is I have not been in a pulpit for two weeks and we could be here a long time, amen? You never, I mean, you never know, amen, amen? Okay, there's one amen, all right. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34, righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 29 and verse two, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. I look at my home, and my daughter has grown, and obviously, uh, out of the home, and so my wife and I, we, we have a wonderful relationship. She is the perfect wife, perfect, and I am the perfect husband. <laughs> That's a joke. That is a joke, but how do I rule in our home? How does my wife rule what she needs to do in the home? Uh, we, we think of our government and uh, we think of a righteous government and an unrighteous government. And you know there's instruction in the Bible for this. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good, and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. We are to pray for those in authority. 
Well, I, I really don't pray for him. I just like to criticize him. We need to pray for him. Amen. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And so we pray for our leaders. But what about if our leaders aren't doing the right thing? Well, they probably need more prayer. But here's a verse in 1 Peter chapter 2. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Um, if you've been in the workforce any time, not all of your bosses are good bosses, right? Um, if you've been married longer than five minutes, you will find that your wife or your husband doesn't always do the right thing. If you have children, children are not perfect, amen? But we want our children to be perfect, and sometimes we're not perfect, and we demand that of our children, amen? It's in authority or under authority and in authority, and that we, we go back and forth in that. But we are, we are to have a certain attitude that God gives us. Um, in the book of Daniel, Daniel was told not to pray by the authorities, by the rulers. He prayed anyway. The disciples in Acts chapter 5 were told not to preach in the name of Jesus, and they preached anyway. And they made this statement, we ought to obey God rather than man. Okay, so there are things that we don't follow the government in. Amen? That we do what's right according to the scriptures. But there are other things, wear your seatbelt. That's no violation of scripture. Well, nobody's going to tell me what to do. That's exactly right. <laughs> that, that attitude just pops out. There are things that we can do that don't violate us being a good Christian. Uh, the three Hebrew children fall down and worship this image. They say, we can't do that. Well, we'll throw you in a fiery furnace. We're not careful to answer the O king. We're not careful. We don't even have to think about it. We're not going to bow down and worship that image. Um, you have in the scriptures Joseph. He was sold as a slave into Egypt. He was a godly young man. And it's Genesis, I think it's chapter 39. He's in Potiphar's house. Potiphar was a ruler. Joseph was his slave. And Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph. He ran out of the house. It meant going to prison, but he was not going to be defiled. You have in 1 Timothy, uh, some shall depart from the faith because of seducing spirits. And so we live in a time where we can be seduced, maybe not morally, but biblically, you know, to believe the wrong, the wrong things. How do we govern our church? Ephesians 5.23, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Colossians 1.18, speaking about Jesus, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Why are there so many problems in government? Not just the government of our nation, the government of our home, the government of our churches, the government, the ruling, the leadership on our jobs. Why is there so much trouble when if there is no trouble, there's peace? Amen? It, for the Christian, it's the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So there's a unity. There's something that brings us together. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, in verse 7, when they demanded a king of Samuel and of God, this is what God said to Samuel. The Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should reign over them. The, the, the reason there is so much conflict is people are not united in following the Lord. The Bible uh, gives us biblical instruction for how we're supposed to operate our homes. There's biblical instruction. There's so much instruction that God gives about our home. Same thing, the order of our work is biblical. You go to work. Uh, this is how you treat the boss, no matter how they treat you. If you don't want to do that, you find another job. Amen? Because you don't want to ruin your testimony. So there's some biblical order. Um, the order of our government is biblical. There's a way to do it. The order of our church is biblical. 
the Jews said about Jesus, we will not have this man to rule over us. The contrast is when the Apostle Paul got saved in Acts chapter 8. He said, who art thou, Lord? And when he knew it was Jesus, he said, what wilt thou have me to do? Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. So I want to bring a message today that ought to bring us some peace in the midst of all the conflict that's going on right now. Because as I watch the news, and it just it pulls me right in. It just pulls me in. And I, then I get frustrated, and I say, I'm not going to watch anymore. You know, I watch part of a debate, and I'm, I'm watching that, and all of a sudden, I don't even want to see it anymore. It just, it, it grinds you, you know what I mean? And, and I'm not picking a candidate behind the pulpit. I've already picked him in my heart and my mind. But I mean, it, you understand what I'm saying, amen? We want it a certain way, but this is the way it actually is. To pray for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godless godliness and honesty. This is good in the sight of God. In Romans chapter 13, again, we read this verse, verse 1, but I want to read the context. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. I'm driving down the road. I've got my, my, uh, oh, it's set, my cruise control set. And I'm legal. Amen? I'm not worrying about a thing. I'm driving on 94, and I see the radar. I see the police car over here. doesn't bother me a bit. I'm just going right along. I am safe, legal. Amen? Uh, that, that police officer is not a terror to me. Uh, I don't have the cruise on, and I'm in a hurry. 80 miles an hour. I see the police car. There's a whole different attitude. Amen. You know what I'm saying? And so we're to obey the laws of the land. But let's go all the way back where all of this started. Here's the principle. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. I will, I will. There's five I wills there. There's rebellion there against God, against God's will. Not my will, but thy will be done. This rebellion spread to Adam and Eve. And so the devil tempted Eve she sinned. She gave the fruit to Adam. He sinned. And because one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Because of that original sin, here we are, right? In the day you eat of the fruit, you're going to know good and evil. But the Bible tells us, I think it's Jeremiah, it could be Isaiah, that they call evil good and good evil, Right? And Paul said in Romans, he said, I, I know what's right to do and I don't do it. And I, I know what I'm supposed to do, you know, and I, I just can't get it accomplished. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we could take a survey about a number of things here, right here in church with Christians. What's your view on this? What's your view on this? And they could be different. One thinks something is good. One thinks something is bad. If you go out on the street, it's magnified. Amen? But good and evil, good and evil, God shows us what those things are. In, Ro in Luke chapter 9, there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest? The disciples. Vote for me. Luke 14, Jesus talked about the chief seats or the chief rooms and warned against trying to be first in line. 
Luke chapter 22, Jesus was there and there was a strife among them because they were talking about who should be the greatest. Matthew 6, Matthew 23, they did what they did to be seen of men. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Boy, that's a peaceful, that's nice, amen? Isn't that nice? Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, 21, 25, 26, the Bible talks about the works of the flesh, and then it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. There's no comparison. Philippians 2, 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Here's a, a good definition of politics. The science of government, that part of ethics, which is behavior, which consists in the regulation and government of a nation or state for the preservation of its safety, peace, and prosperity. But politics has become a battle for supremacy, a battle for control. And again, when we think of politics, we immediately think of the government, but that's that runs down, that, that comes into all of our lives, every day of our life. In Revelation chapter 3, the church of the Laodiceans is, I believe, the last church mentioned. It says that's the seventh church, but I believe that's the last church age. I believe that's the age that we're in right now. Laodicea means rights of the people. And we have a church where we meet together and yeah, let's vote on this and vote on that. But we follow Bible principle and Christ is the head of the church. The pastor's not the head, Christ is the head. I'm a part of the body, you're a part of the body. And when the body works together, amen, this isn't about the rights of the people in that sense. This is about the right of God to our life. We're bought with a price. Glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are his. And so he is the head of the church. Amen? And that's a good thing. That brings peace. In 3 John, verses 9 through 12, we read about Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence, and they, he wouldn't even receive John and his disciples. God's government is not a democracy. It's a theocracy. God is the head. Revelation 19, the Lord's coming back. Um, again, this is all introduction. Amen? That is so good to be back. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Revelation 19, the Lord's coming back. Verse 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen? One party, one heart, one accord, one person to worship. Almighty God. It's not the Liberal Party, the Conservative Party, the Independent Party. We're all one. Amen? We're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we esteem others better than ourselves. And we minister one to another. And we do all of this with the love of God in our heart. That's peace. To know that that is real. It's such safety. It's such a blessing to know that. Uh, ambition, position, power are the forces that corrupt politics. And I dare not get off the track here. I mean, because you can talk about that all day. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. This is the beginning of the church. We have Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Back in the book of Judges, two times, uh, the Bible says um, there was no king in Israel and every man did that w which was right in his own eyes. Two times it says that towards the end of the book of Judges. And you have that Judges cycle, sin, servitude, supplication, salvation. There are six Judges that come to being in the book of Judges, different, different time frames, because Israel sinned, they were in servitude to another nation, and so they prayed supplication, and then there was salvation. God sent another judge. And God, with God, there's such peace. And we want peace in our land. We may not have peace in our land. We want peace in our world. We may not have peace in our world, but we can have peace in our heart. And that is what's critical, amen? Otherwise, we become like the politician who is unrighteous in their dealings or their rulings. 
well, nobody's going to tell me what to do. And then we get the attitude, and it's just, it, we just devour. We bite and devour one another and destroy one another. We have in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let all things be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. That is old-fashioned. That is just old-fashioned, but it's biblical. Amen? Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 6, get back to the old paths, wherein dwelleth the good way, and God gives us instruction. We have Hebrews 13, 17, and I hope you understand this verse. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. If a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? That's the context. But there are some decisions a pastor makes that somebody else wouldn't make, and there's decisions that the church makes that the pastor doesn't make. Amen? And so we're in authority and we're under authority and we work together because we're all under God. We're all trying to do what the Lord wants us to do. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. When you come to Galatians 5.20, I mentioned this earlier, these are the works of the flesh. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. What is that? That's a difference that produces dispute or controversy. It's disagreement. It's discord. It says, wrath, strife, seditions. What is a sedition? That's rising opposition to a law or authority. Uh, we have in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as, as iniquity and idolatry. When those things are present, there's no peace. There's not one accord, there's discord. You say, why are you preaching this? Relax, this is good, amen, we're doing fine here. But our country and how, how our future, the future of the country goes is going to affect us. I have felt myself losing my peace, losing my comfort from the Lord. And I'm thinking, okay, how am I supposed to respond to this? Hence the message today, amen. So I'm preaching this for me, if it doesn't affect you, you can take a little nap, and I'll wake you up when we're done. Amen? About 2.30. <laughs> okay. Um, how about this one? 2 Timothy 3, verse 4. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. It goes on. But it says in verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Traitors. A traitor is one who violates his allegiance and betrays his own country. That is a traitor. He delivers his country to its enemy. That's what a traitor is. That is a terrible, terrible word. And the Bible says in the last days, that is what's going to take place. And that word traitors is put in the midst of all of these other descriptions because you see many facets of the same the same gem there second peter chapter 2 and verse 10 but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government presumptuous are they self-willed they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities it it affects us when we hear those things now who is our enemy who's the enemy of the church we know it's the devil. He's called the enemy in the Bible. I want you to take your Bibles. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. David is the king, King David, and he has a son by the name of Absalom. You're familiar with the story. Uh, David is a good king. He has fallen. God's brought him back. I mean, he's just, he's a man just like anybody else. He's a sinner, but God used David mightily. He was the sweet psalmist of Israel, man after God's own heart. So he's the king. He has a son, Absalom. Let's read about him, beginning in verse 1. It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, 
of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, Oh, that I were made a judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment, and so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. If you watched the primaries and you watched all these candidates and they're downing one another, you know, and because they want the nomination, and now that somebody is nominated, now they're all buddies. And so, I mean, it's just politics. It's politics, amen? Oh, if only I were the judge. No, if only I were the judge. No, if only I were the judge, you know? And it's, it's vote for me. And the disciples did it. And listen, we do it. We want to give an impression. We want, we want to be over as well as under, amen? And we have to be careful about these things. What is the cause of all this variance, sedition, rebellion, contention? Well, we know it's the devil. And the devil is called the king of pride in the book of Job. And pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. And I mean, those verses are so, only by pride cometh contention, the Bible tells us. In Luke 9, 46, there arose a reasoning among them which of them should be the greatest. Uh, we won't take the time to turn back there, but in Numbers chapter 13, uh, Israel is getting ready to go into the land. Uh, they send 12 spies into the land to spy it out, and they come back. And by the way, those 12 spies were leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so they come back, and ten spies bring an evil report. Joshua and Caleb brought a good report. The ten spies said, we are not able to go. The two, sp two spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, we are well able to go. But the other spy says, no, we're like grasshoppers in their sight, and man, it's bad, and there's walled cities, and there are iron chariots, and we'll never do it. But God had already said, you can have that land. So that's why Joshua and Caleb said that. You come to chapter 14, and there's an uprising because of the 10 spies that brought the evil report. The, the um, most people, the majority, are not always right. Amen? Sometimes it's a minority. So they said, let's make us a new leader, a captain. Not you, Moses. Let's make us a captain and go back to Egypt. Isn't that amazing? And then there's some, there's some circumstances because of that and some results because of that. The 10 spies died, and everybody 20 and under died in the wilderness, and, uh, or 20 and older died in the wilderness. So in Numbers chapter 16 and verse 3, you would think the problem is solved. Listen, we can solve this problem today in our own hearts, and it'll pop up again. We have to come back to the scripture. That's the only thing that is going to help us to memorize the Bible, you know, to know how to deal with it. Uh, if anybody here has any problems with pride, memorize some verses on pride. And when you start to get proud, quote the verses. Amen? Uh, fear, quote the verses. Fret not. Uh, all of those things. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in the Lord. I will trust and not be afraid. Just get the verses in your mind because that's how you fight the devil. Because this is in us. This is the works of the flesh. I want to be in charge. You're wrong. I'm right. It's my way or the highway. I'm, and you might have the sweetest way of presenting that, but it's still the same spirit. Amen? Numbers chapter 16 and verse 3. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then do ye lift up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? That's what they said to Moses. 
And Moses says back to them in verse 7, ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. What a standoff. Well, you're taking too much upon you. No, you're taking too much upon you. How do you settle that? You always go to the Word of God. You always see what God has to say about it. Order and authority is given by God to bring peace. He's a good God. Amen. Amen. He wants to give peace in the home, in the government, at the workplace. Amen? Amen. A soft answer turneth away wrath. In the school, at the job, he wants peace. The greatest tra traitor in history, who is he? Benedict Arnold, right? Benedict Arnold. He was a hero for America in the Revolutionary War. Hero. But through marriage or family, he went to the other side. Uh, some say he did it for money. Some say he did it for family. But he is synonymous. That name is synonymous with traitor. He sold out his country. He sold out his country. I think the greatest traitor in history was Judas. Amen? In the Bible. Matthew 26, 14. And one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went into the chief priest. I, I'm sure you've read this before, but every word of God is important. And, and think how God states this. One of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. What will ye give me? Usually when you're selling something, you put the price on it. He sold the Lord out. They offered him thirty pieces of silver. According to Zechariah, that's the price of a slave. He had no uh, worship of the Lord Jesus, no value in him. He sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Isn't that amazing? By selling Christ out, we can sell out our brethren. We can sell out our country. We can sell out our church. I love to hear when a politician mentions God or something righteous according to the scripture. Amen? I love to hear that and how grieved I am when they don't, when they don't do that. The spirit that produces discord, what will you give me? The spirit that produces rebellion or contention, what will you give me? What do I get out of this? In 2 Timothy 3, 4, traitors. In Revelation 2, 4, nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. I, I want to give an opportunity today to vote, just to vote. There's an election that's going to take place in just a few moments, and that is to put Christ on the throne, make him king of our, your life, or anybody else. It could be the flesh, it could be you, it could be career, it could be whatever it is. Jesus needs to be on the throne. Amen? Amen? And we can vote for that. And if we vote for the Lord, that brings peace in our heart. But what about them? What if they don't vote? We may be dealing with that. I don't think so, but we may be dealing with that in just a few short days. I know what I desire. Okay, so if God doesn't allow that to happen, what I'm praying for What's going to happen to my Christianity? What's going to happen to my life? You know? What am I going to do because of all of this? Am I going to, you know, be unhappy the rest of my life? Or am I going to love the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my might? I've watched some TV shows, movies, that when they were over, my wife and I will look at each other and we'll say, what did we watch that for? You know, you were, waiting, you were waiting for something good to happen at the end. You know, I don't know if you've ever been through anything like that. And there's others, and I'm sitting there, and I got, I got tears coming down. But I don't want Linda to know that I'm crying right now, you know. So, she, she knows me, though. And, I mean, there are some movies that you watch, and they just, they get your heart. Amen? 
And yet there was tragedy in that movie. But you saw why the tragedy happened. I know this. The Lord's coming back. I know, I know this. I know this for sure. I'm a Christian. I know I'm saved. I know that God wants me to be a light in this world. And I know that he wants me to be a testimony for him. Amen. And he came to seek and to save those which were lost. He came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. I want to vote for him. I want to vote for him. And my flesh wants to be the greatest all the time. I want to be right. Who doesn't want to be right? But sometimes we're wrong. Probably more times than being right. Amen? But how does God want us to respond to this? I think this message is so timely. You've got another week of news and then the election. And if you watch that, and it can tear you apart. It can take all of your joy. It can make you afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. King, we're not careful to answer thee. Our God is able to deliver us. If God wants to, he's able to deliver us. But if not, we're not going to bow down to your image. We'll go into the burning, fiery furnace. And Paul and Silas don't preach anymore. Well, we're going to preach. So they beat him and they threw him into prison. They were singing praises to God. That's what God wants. Amen. If he is on the throne, thy will, not my will be done. There's a verse, and I don't, want to, I don't mean to get negative. I want this to be so positive. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We are not ushering in the millennial kingdom. Amen. There's going to be a big rebellion coming here soon. And I don't know when it's going to take place. I don't, I don't have every I dotted and every T crossed. But I know there's going to be a tribulation period of which I'm not going to be a part of that. But what is leading up to that? I don't know. I'm praying that it gets better the next four years, the next eight years, the next 12 years, and then I don't care anymore. <laughs> you know, after that, I'm, uh, anyway. God's good. Uh, God's good. And if you want real peace, just put him on the throne today. Amen? Because that's what he wants for you. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your word. Politics. It's a scary word, but it can be a good thing. And I pray, Lord, for all of us here that are in authority over someone, that we'll have a humble spirit, that we will minister, lead, rule, whatever you've used language in the Bible with humility with mercy and God for those that are over us we pray that we would pray for them and to have humility and to serve you to do it as unto the Lord bless us today God give us all peace may the church be of one accord one mind one heart that we might please you in all that we do Father, we'll thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand, please.